So we're working through this problem and we calculated the mass of potassium chloride. So we have 35.45 gram, grams plus 39 grams. That in turn gives us a molar mass of 74.55 grams. So we have our balanced equation for the following reaction. We're only expected, we only want to determine the expected mass of product. So we're using our product method and we're converting our one gram of potassium chloride to the grams of mercury one chloride. So first we're gonna to convert to moles of potassium chloride by dividing by the molar mass. Now we're gonna break out our stoichiometric ratio. So how many moles of HgCl2 or mercury one chloride, Hg2Cl2, do we produce per mole of KCl that reacts? What's our mole to mole ratio in our chemical equation? Yep. One to two, one to two. One mole of mercury, one chloride made for every two moles of potassium chloride that reacts. And then finally, I've given you the molar masses. So let's look up and let's just write our molar masses. We know that there are 534.04 grams for every one mole of mercury, one chloride. And if we punch that into our calculator, if we punch that into our calculator really quickly, we in turn get 3.5817 grams of Hg2Cl2, and this is from potassium chloride. Now, let's, are we done with this problem? Can we just call it a day at this point? Or do we need to also do the same calculation for our other reactant? Can we just call it a day at this point? Are we done with this example? Have we completely checked all of the possibilities? I see a lot of people typing no, and that's exactly right. We're gonna to need to do the same calculation from our starting material of mercury nitrate. So if we start off with one gram of mercury nitrate in one mole of mercury one nitrate, let's look up. So for mercury one nitrate, it has a molar mass of 525.19. So let's plug that in. Okay, now let's look at our stoichiometric ratio. How many moles of mercury one chloride do we make per mole of mercury one nitrate? What is our mole to mole ratio? What's our mole to mole ratio? Looking at our chemical equation, what's our mole to mole ratio of mercury one chloride to mercury one nitrate? What's our mole to mole ratio? And don't be shy to type it in chat, one to one, exactly right. Okay, finally, all we have to do now is plug in our molar mass, which is 534.04 grams per one mole of HgCl2. Okay, perfect. And so from our mercury one nitrate, if we punch this into the calculator now, we get 1 over 525.19 times 534.04, we get 1.016 grams of mercury chloride. So which reactant is limiting? Which reactant is limiting? KCl or mercury 1 nitrate? Which reactant's limiting? KCl or mercury one nitrate? Yep, exactly right. Mercury one nitrate is limiting because it generates the least amount of product. So this is our actual yield. So mercury one nitrate is limiting. Just for completeness sake, we're gonna round this answer to two sig figs, so we get 1.0 grams of Hg2Cl2 or mercury one chloride. Yep, yep, that's why I, I write the full number out initially just to avoid introducing rounding error, and then I round at the end once we've identified our limiting reactant 
and we've identified the expected yield of product from our limiting reactant. Does that make sense? Okay, perfect. So now that we've done one of these examples together, I'd like you to take a moment and I'd like you to process the following example. I'll, I'll give everyone about three minutes to get the chemical equation up and running, and then we'll discuss the chemical equation, and then I'll let you loose to work on the stoichiometry. This, pro this problem's a little bit more complicated than the previous example because you're not only gonna have to tell me the amount of product generated, but also the mass of excess reactant that remains. So let's work on getting some formulas and getting our balanced equation established. So now that you've had a few moments to work through and write your balanced equation, I'd like you to tell me for iron three chloride, would someone like to type into chat the formula of iron three chloride? Yep, exactly right. Okay. And for silver nitrate, would someone like to provide the formula for silver nitrate? Yep, so we have AgNO3, just one. Oh, for those who proposed AgNO3 too, remember that silver has a charge of silver plus, well, nitrate has a charge of minus one. When we cross our charges, we just get AgNO3. Okay. With that knowledge in mind, would someone like to provide me a formula for the mass of silver? Uh, sorry, would someone like to provide me a formula for silver chloride? What's the formula for silver chloride, given that silver is a fixed charge transition metal with a charge of plus one. Yep, AGCL, exactly right. Okay, and what other product do we generate in this reaction? What other product? Yep, um, can we be a little more specific? For iron, nit for iron nitrate, would you be able to provide me? Yes, thank you. So. It's not FeNO3, but it's FeNO3, because we have iron three plus to start, and now we have iron three plus to end. We, cro we cross our charges, and that in turn gives us FeNO3, just to ensure atoms are conserved. This is a typical precipitation exchange reaction. Now my question to all of you is, is this equation balanced as written? Is this equation balanced as written? No. So then, which atoms are not balanced? Which atoms are unbalanced in this case? Yep, chlorine is unbalanced. So we have three chlorines on the left, 
So what coefficient? We have one chlorine on the right, but what coefficient do we need to get three chlorines? What coefficient do we need in front of silver chloride? Three, exactly right. And now that we have three silvers on the right, if we have one silver on the left, one times what would give us three silvers? What coefficient do we need in front of silver nitrate? Three, exactly right. So now we have our balanced equation. If you don't have the correct balanced equation, you're just stuck in these problems. So let's now that we have our balanced equation, I'd like you to take a moment and try to calculate the expected mass of silver chloride. So we'll have this as response A, and the mass of expected reactant will be response B. And you're welcome to type in chat um, if you, once you come up with a response for part A and part B of the question. So I'll give everyone about three to four minutes to work through that. Don't be shy to ask questions via chat, but I really want to make sure that you're attempting these problems so that way if you have any questions that come about when you're solving these problems, we can get them addressed. And if you have any questions, don't be shy to type it in the chat. Does anyone have any responses for parts A or B? Don't be shy if not, as long as you're working through the problem, just so that way we can have a productive discussion. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm seeing a lot of reasonable responses for part A. So let's talk about part A now. So I'm going to use the product method in this case. So first and foremost, let's start with our 18.00 grams of iron 3 chloride. We're going from grams of iron 3 chloride to grams of silver chloride. So we know that in one mole of iron three chloride, we have 162.20 grams. Perfect. Now let's focus on our reaction stoichiometry for a moment. How many moles of silver chloride do we make per mole of iron three chloride? What's our mole to mole ratio? What's our mole to mole ratio of silver chloride to, is it one to three or three to one? Let's look, what's the coefficient for silver chloride? So we have three moles of silver chloride per one mole of iron three chloride. Exactly right, exactly right. Now I'm being a little nice in these problems because I'm giving you the molar masses, but we all know how to calculate it. Let's focus more on just developing our fundamental skills. We know that we have 143.32 grams per mole of silver chloride. So all we have to do now is punch this into our calculator and we'll get our first 
uh, we're getting our expected yield assuming we completely consumed all of our iron three chloride, which is a bit of a tentative assumption at this point. So from our iron three chloride, we would expect 47.71 grams of silver chloride. But we aren't done. We have to repeat this calculation for silver nitrate. So from 16.00 grams of silver nitrate, we're now going to calculate the amount of expected products. We're going from grams of silver nitrate to grams of silver chloride. Okay, so we know in one mole of silver nitrate, we have 169.87 grams. Wonderful. Now let's focus on our stoichiometry because it's not just the moles, it's how those moles react and what stoichiometric ratio are each species reacting based on. So my question to all of you is how many moles of silver chloride do we make? per mole of silver nitrate. What is our mole to mole ratio for silver nitrate? What's our mole to mole ratio? Yep, three to three, which simplifies to one to one, but I always like to write the baseline number just so that way I don't get confused. So we know just like before, we have 143.32 grams per every one mole of silver chloride. So let's punch that into our calculator. So we have 16.00 divided by 169.87 times three over three times 143.32. And that in turn gives us 13.499 grams, which we round to 13.50 grams of silver chloride. So comparing these two species, which reactant is limiting? Silver nitrate or iron three chloride? Which species is limiting? Which species generates the least amount of product when completely consumed? Yep, uh, yep, exactly right. Silver nitrate is limiting. Yep, perfect, perfect, exactly right. Exactly right. So in our next step, in our next step, our goal is to calculate the excess iron three chloride left over. So the way that we set this up, we start with our 18.00 grams of iron three chloride. That's all fine and good. We then subtract, we then subtract the mass of product generated from our limiting reactant, and we convert our grams of silver chloride to grams of F iron three chloride reacted. So in one mole, we're just going, our, going through this conversion up here in reverse. So in one mole of silver chloride, we have 143.32 grams we know that we have one mole of iron three chloride for three moles of silver chloride. And then finally, we know that for iron three chloride, we have a mass of 162.20 grams in one mole of iron three chloride. So all we have to do now is punch this expression into our calculator. Again, we're using the mass of product from our limiting reactant to determine how much of our excess reactant did we use up. So let's punch this into our calculator. And at the end, would someone like to volunteer a response from this expression? How much iron three chloride do we have left over? I want to make sure that everyone can enter this into their calculator comfortably, because otherwise you're going to end up losing points in the exam for all these random calculator errors. 
So would someone like to provide a response? Yep, exactly right. You get 12.907 grams of FeCl3, which we then round to 12.91 grams of iron three chloride left over. Yep, exactly right. Perfect. Does that make sense? Is everyone comfortable with this logic? Okay, so let's do, let's do one last example. Let's talk about one last idea. So it concerns the idea of percent yield. So you do not often recover all of your product from the chemical reaction. This is for two reasons. One, chemical reactions are not 100% quantitative. There are competing side reactions that reduce your yield. Also, material is lost during isolation. So percent yield is the amount of product obtained compared to the theoretical yield assuming the reaction consumed all reactants up to the limiting reagent. So percent yield is the isolated yield over the theoretical yield. And the theoretical yield you calculate using stoichiometry. So to give an example, if your reaction is expected to yield 200 milligrams of product and you isolate 100 milligrams, um, to answer the question in the chat, yes, it will be. Um, so given this, for our percent yield, what is our isolated yield? What is our isolated yield in this problem? How much material did we actually get from this reaction? How much material did we actually get? And don't be shy to type in the chat. What is our, yep, 100 milligrams isolated. Oh, oh, so we're talking about this question right here. And what is our theoretical yield? How much product would we expect to get assuming a complete reaction that consumes our limiting reactant? 200 milligrams, exactly. So if we multiply by 100%, we get a percent yield of 50%. So a percent yield is a useful tool for assessing the, the throughput and out, well, assessing the output and efficiency of a reaction in terms of how much product can you get from your reaction. So let's do an example where we apply percent yield and we combine it together with stoichiometry. So aluminum and oxygen react to make aluminum oxide. In this experiment, 75 grams of aluminum and 200 grams of oxygen produce 125 grams of aluminum oxide. So this is our isolated yield. Okay, so to calculate the theoretical yield, what, what, what is the theoretical yield fundamentally? What is the theoretical yield representing? Have we calculated this before? Have we calculated the amount mass of product expected from a reaction? Is that anything new? Yeah, it's a perfect yield. Assuming our limiting reactant is completely consumed and we generate all the product we can from our limiting reactant. So then, in order to calculate the theoretical yield, we're gonna use the product method. Okay, so let's start. We need a balanced chemical equation here. So first things first, I'm gonna write out my formula. So aluminum is Al solid. Would someone like to provide me the formula for oxygen? What is the formula for oxygen in this case? What is the formula for oxygen? O2, exactly right, it's a diatomic element. Would someone like to chip in and provide me the formula for aluminum oxide? Yep, exactly right, Al2O3 solid. Okay, perfect, so we have our equation. Our equation is not balanced as written. So I'm gonna help us out by balancing this equation. So we have three oxygens on the left, we have two oxygens on the right. I'm gonna use my least common multiple method. 
I'm gonna put a two and a three here to balance our oxygens. So remember, this is the least common multiple method. And then we balance aluminum last by putting a four in front of aluminum. You can also use the half notation method. That's perfectly acceptable. Um, whatever works for you. Okay, so we wanna make sure our balancing process is pretty fast. So here's our balanced equation. And now I'd like everyone to take a moment and I'd like everyone to try and calculate the theoretical yield of aluminum oxide. So how many grams of aluminum oxide do we expect given that we have 75 grams of aluminum and 200 grams of oxygen? So let's take about five minutes to work through this problem and then we'll come together as a group to discuss. So don't be shy to type questions in chat or provide me a reasonable response for the theoretical yield of aluminum oxide. And we've done this kind of problem time and time again in this chapter. So just because I'm asking it in a different, slightly different wording, you still know and you still have the fundamental skills. Does anyone have a reasonable response or would anyone like to propose a response for the theoretical yield of aluminum oxide? Does anyone have any questions? Just wanna make sure that uh, we have some student input in these problems so that way it's not just, okay, perfect. I am already seeing students propose their answers. So let's talk about part A, the theoretical yield. So I'm gonna use the product method once again. It's not that I don't like the ice method. I actually like the ice method a lot, but for the product method, it often is a little bit cleaner for these sort of short, we just need the yield of product kind of questions. So starting off, we have 75.0 grams of aluminum. We're going from grams of aluminum to grams of aluminum oxide. So then in one mole of aluminum, we have 27.0 grams. Now this is where you need your chemical equation. If you don't have a balanced chemical equation, this is where the wheels are gonna fall off. So how many moles of aluminum oxide do we make per mole of aluminum? What is our mole to mole ratio? What is our mole to mole ratio? Two to four. Exactly right. And now 
would someone be able to volunteer how many grams of aluminum oxide are in one mole of aluminum oxide? Would someone be able to volunteer just would someone be able to volunteer the molar mass of aluminum oxide? Would someone be able to volunteer that really quickly? Yep, 101.96. Good, good. So we're gonna punch this into our calculator and we'll get our first expected theoretical yield. we get our first theoretical yield of 141.61 grams of aluminum oxide. Let's repeat the same calculation. Let's re repeat the same calculation for our mass of oxygen. So we have 200 grams of oxygen. We know for every one mole of O2, we have 32.0 grams of oxygen. Now let's plug in our stoichiometry. Let's plug in our stoichiometric coefficient. So how many moles of aluminum oxide do we get out per mole of oxygen? What's our mole to mole ratio? Yep, two to three. And then our molar mass is exactly the same for our product. So we can save a little bit of mental headspace by just copying that down. So let's punch that into our calculator now. So we get an expected mass of 424.83 grams of aluminum oxide. So the first case is from aluminum, the second case it's from oxygen. So which reactant is limiting? What mass do we actually generate? What, what mass of product do we actually make in this reaction? And this is really critical. What mass of product are we actually making? 140, uh, oh, okay. I see some students typing aluminum's limiting. So then that's exactly right. So the mass of product that we generate is the mass of product from complete reaction of aluminum. We still follow the rules of limiting reactants. You can only make product if you have enough of each reactant, right? So let's just round this number to three sig figs and that gives 141 grams of aluminum oxide. Perfect. So we've checked off our first portion. So let's now delve into percent yield. Let's delve into percent yield. So percent yield is isolated over theoretical times 100%. Okay, so looking, looking at our equation, whoops, one moment. Our isolated yield is 125 grams. So let's plug that in. So we have, sorry about that, one moment. So we have 125 grams. What is our theoretical yield? What is our theoretical yield? Ah, yes, you're exactly right. Yep, exactly right. And you're correct in noting that our theoretical yield is 142 grams. We're then going to multiply by 100%, and that gives us a percent yield of 88.0%. So this is a relatively efficient reaction. Is everyone comfortable with this concept presented so far, the idea of percent yield? You just take your isolated over your theoretical. And the theoretical you calculate using stoichiometry, the isolated yield will overwhelmingly be given to you. Everyone comfortable so far? Any questions? Everyone's pretty quiet in the chat. So,
let's now take a moment and I'd like you to tackle the following problem. So we're going to spend about three minutes writing the formula. Oh, the 125. So if we read through the front part of our problem, we, in an experiment, we reacted a certain mass of aluminum and a certain mass of oxygen, and we generated 125 grams of aluminum oxide. That's our isolated yield. Yep. So I'd like you all just to wrap up this chapter. I'd like you all now to write out the equation for the following reaction. And I'd like you to tell me if we have 19 grams of iron and it's allowed to react with a solution containing 0.6 moles of hydrochloric acid, I'd like you to calculate the mass of iron 3 chloride produced. And this will be the last example that we cover this chapter. So take a few moments to work on that, and then we'll come together as a group to discuss in about two minutes for our chemical equation. So really focus on getting your chemical equation all sorted out. And if you would like, you can provide me your responses for the um, expected mass of iron three chloride and the percent yield once you reach that point in the calculations. We'll resume in about a minute and a half to discuss um, the balanced chemical equation. You wanna be pretty fast at writing these balanced chemical equations. So that way you can focus on the meat of the problem, which is stoichiometry. So let's talk a little bit about this equation. So would someone like to provide me a formula for hydrochloric acid? Would someone like to provide me a formula for hydrochloric acid? HCl, exactly right. Okay, insoluble iron three oxide. Would someone like to provide me a formula for iron three oxide? This is where you have to break out your nomenclature. Yep, Fe2O3 is exactly right. So we have Fe3 plus O2 minus, we cross our charges. Perfect, perfect. Iron 3 chloride, would someone like to provide me a formula for iron 3 chloride? Yep, FeCl3, exactly right. Okay, and water is generated as a byproduct. Now let's look and let's balance this equation. So what atoms are unbalanced? Which atom do you want to start by balancing? Iron, yep. That's a good choice. So we have two irons on the left. We have one iron on the right. So what do we need to multiply? our coefficient by to get two irons on each side. What coefficient do we need to choose for iron three chloride? Two, exactly right. One times two gives us two irons. Perfect. Now let's balance, uh, let's pick chlorine just arbitrarily. So we have six chlorines on the right. We have one chlorine on the left. One times what would give us six chlorines? What coefficient would we plug in? Six, exactly right. Now we have six hydrogens on the left. We have two hydrogens on the right. Two hydrogen times what would give us six hydrogen? What coefficient should we plug in? Three, exactly right. 
Perfect. So now we have a balanced chemical equation. I'm going to erase this balancing work just to make more space. And I'd like you now to take about three to four minutes and I'd like you to calculate the expected yield of iron three chloride. So we'll resume this discussion in about three minutes. And don't be shy to send me a message in the chat with questions or with your proposed response. Don't be shy to send your responses with proposed yields for the following reaction. Okay, so I'm seeing some reasonable student responses sent to me for the expected mass of iron three chloride. So let's start. And again, we're going to use our good old friend, the product method. So we have 19.0 grams of iron three oxide. And would someone be able to volunteer the molar mass? So just as a summary of what's going on here, we're going from grams of iron three oxide to grams of iron three chloride. So to do that, we're gonna to need to use our reaction stoichiometry and do some mole to mole conversions. So in one mole of iron three oxide, we have a mass of 159.7 grams. Okay. Let's now plug in our reaction stoichiometry. So how many moles of iron three chloride do we make per mole of iron three oxide? What is our mole to mole ratio? Yep, two to one. Good, 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 good. Okay, now we have to plug in the molar mass of iron three chloride. So let's deal with that now. Whoops. So how many grams are present in one mole of iron three chloride? What is the molar mass of iron three chloride? Would someone like to volunteer that in the chat? What is the molar mass of iron three chloride? Let's just to make sure everyone's comfortable calculating molar masses. 162.17, perfect. So all we have to do is now punch this mass to mass conversion into our calculator. So we have 19.0 grams divided by 159.7 grams per mole. 
times our two to one stoichiometric ratio times our molar mass of 162.17, and that gives us a mass of 35.58 grams of iron three chloride. And this is from our iron three oxide. So we have to repeat this calculation now. We have to repeat this calculation now for our hydrochloric acid. So we have 0. One moment about that. We have 0. 0.6 moles of hydrochloric acid. And we know that looking at our stoichiometry, how many moles of iron three chloride do we make? per mole of hydrochloric acid. What's our mole to mole ratio? What's our mole to mole ratio? For iron three chloride and hydrochloric acid? Yep, two to six. So we have two moles of iron three chloride per six moles of HCl. Okay, and now we have 162.17 grams per one mole of iron three chloride. And if we punch that into our calculator, 0 0.6 times two over six times 162.17, we get an expected mass of 32434 grams of iron three chloride that we then round to 30 grams of iron three chloride. Now if we compare our masses, which reactant produce, which reactant is limiting? Which reactant is limiting? Hydrochloric acid or iron three oxide? Which reactant is limiting? Which reactant is limiting? hydrochloric acid. So in reality, we only make 30 grams of iron three chloride. Now as a follow-up, we're asked to calculate the percent yield if 20 grams of iron three chloride are isolated. So percent yield is equal to isolated over theoretical times 100%, our isolated yield is 20 grams, our theor theoretical yield is 30 grams. We punch this into our calculator and we get a percent yield of 67% that we round to 70% to follow our one sig fig. So percent yield is really just a nice, easy, tacked on um, calculation at the end. The bulk of this problem is still a limiting reactant and stoichiometry problem. Does that make sense so far? Is everyone comfortable with this idea so far? Okay, so that's the end of this chapter. So we're gonna move on now to chapter seven, which primarily concerns, oops, if it can transition, One moment, we'll transition to chapter seven. During this time, please get out your chapter seven notes. And remember, the notes are all posted on Canvas. Okay, so let's zoom in now and let's discuss our chapter seven, which concerns acid-base chemistry and pH. This is a nice, easy chapter with some pretty simple formulas. You're gonna really wanna pay attention to this chapter for 102, so that way you aren't completely exposed to a ton of new concepts when we discuss acid-base chemistry in Chem 102. So let's talk about our basic definitions of acids and bases. So the first major definition is the Arrhenius definition. An Arrhenius acid dissociates to give H plus in solution. 
So anytime you see H plus generated, we're dealing with an Arrhenius acid. Now in terms of our Arrhenius bases, Arrhenius bases, they react with water or dissociate to give hydroxide in solution. So anytime you see hydroxide generated, that's your sign that you're dealing with an Arrhenius base. So examples of this are, for example, sodium hydroxide dissociates to make hydroxide since it's a soluble hydroxide salt. For an example of reactivity, methoxide reacts with water to make hydroxide. So two mechanisms in which you can generate hydroxide, where hydroxide is the key for the Arrhenius base definition. Okay, let's talk about Bronsted acids. So Bronsted acids are H plus donors. They're proton donors. So for example, hydrochloric acid donates its proton to water to make hydroni. Does everyone see how hydrochloric acid has transferred a proton, has lost a proton in this acid-base reaction? By the, by, by the opposite hand, Bronsted bases are H plus acceptors. So for example, ammonia in this case is going to accept an equivalent of, hy of hydrogen. It's going to accept a proton from water. So a Bronsted base is an H plus acceptor. It's the one gaining the proton. In aqueous solution, hydrogen ions will react with water to form hydronium ions. In this case, water is acting as a base. Okay, we're just dealing with some definitions for now. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about how we can apply these definitions. So acids and bases typically are covalent compounds that are soluble in water. Many, many of these compounds are covalent compounds soluble in water. So an, as, an acid can be thought of as an H plus donor. And a critical feature of acids, when we think about ionic equations, acids will dissociate to give H plus and their conjugate base in solution. Okay, so in solution, an acid is going to break apart to yield H plus and the conjugate base. So in this case, for example, hydrochloric acid breaks up to yield H plus and its conjugate base of chloride minus. Now, bases are H plus acceptors. So bases react with water to give hydroxide and their conjugate acid. So for example, a base essentially is accepting H plus, it's gaining a proton from water. So in this case, if we start off with sodium hydride, which we can view as H minus, if H minus gains a proton, gains an H plus, we generate H2 gas. We also have sodium plus left over. So the conjugate acid has one additional proton compared to the base. Any questions so far? Okay, let's just keep going through some of these definitions. So bases, we can think of bases in an alternative way that they dissociate to generate hydroxide in solution. So in terms of strong and weak bases, our strong bases are soluble ionic salts containing hydroxide. So these are, these are group 1A and group 2A hydroxide salts. So the main feature, if we were drawing a solution picture, is that strong bases dissociate completely to give hydroxide and they're mainly ions in solution. So let's draw a picture of barium hydroxide. So we have barium 2 plus, and we have our hydroxide equivalents. 
So we have our hydroxide ions. Okay, so if we take this sample and we put it into solution, so we put it into some water, so this is gonna be our water. Since barium hydroxide is a strong base, it's going to dissociate and we're gonna have mainly ions in solution. We're gonna have mainly ions in solution. So the key takeaway, the key takeaway that I want you to remember for this, strong bases completely dissociate to give ions in solution. So our barium hydroxide is gonna break up into barium two plus aqueous and two hydroxide ions in solution. Allow me one moment to reload one note. Any questions so far while we just momentarily reload one note? Any questions so far that I can address? Give me one second to reopen OneNote and we'll resume in one moment. Okay, so the key takeaway that we get from this pictorial representation is that strong bases dissociate completely to give ions in solution. So for example, barium hydroxide breaks up to yield barium two plus and two hydroxide ions. So if I was drawing this with a little more respect for the number of ions that we have in our ion ratio, I'd draw two bariums and four hydroxides. Does this molecular picture for strong bases make sense to everyone? The idea that strong bases will completely dissociate in solution. Does that make sense? Okay. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna talk a little bit about weak bases. These are compounds typically containing an NHX or what we call an amine functional group. These compounds dissociate less than 1% in solution. We have mainly dissolved molecular compound in solution. So if we think about CH3NH2, which is methylamine, if we're looking at a molecular picture of methyl methylamine, should I draw mainly ions or molecules? Looking at the definition, should I draw mainly ions or molecules? Molecules, yep. So we have CH3NH2, 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 and I'm gonna draw an ion, CH3NH3+, plus, and OH-. minus. So the key takeaway for weak bases, weak bases, is we have mainly molecules in solution. So for example, if we have methylamine reacting with water, we'll have a very small amount 
of hydroxide and ammonium salt present. So we have mainly molecules in solution. This will be important when we start writing what are known as net ionic equations. So we've looked at our strong and weak bases. Let's look at our strong acids. So our strong acids, nitric, perchloric, sulfuric, hydrochloric, bromic, and hydroiodic acids. So strong acids dissociate completely in solution to give H plus and their conjugate base. These are main, mainly ions in solution. So for example, if we're looking at hydrobromic acid and we look at a picture of a solution of hydrobromic acid, should I draw mainly ions or molecules? Should I draw mainly ions or molecules? Ions, exactly right. So hydrobromic acid is going to break up to yield H plus and Br minus. Remember, we can use our exact same method to figure out the charge of each ion to figure out the charge of our conjugate base. So I'm going to draw H plus, Br minus. Okay, so the key feature for strong acids, we have mainly ions in solution. Okay, so for weak acids, I, I like this definition. So any acid not listed as a strong acid in that table above, for this class and this class only, you can assume it's a weak acid. So weak acids dissociate less than 1% in solution, and we have mainly dissolved molecular compounds. Would someone like to propose to me a weak acid for us to study? We have a list of acids that we've looked at. Would someone like to provide to me a weak acid for us to study? Um, ammonia is, would be a weak base. Let's try to think of a weak acid. So some, a compound in our naming conventions that's named as an acid or a compound that has an H plus equivalent. Who's going to propose a weak acid? Uh, let's try one other, the water is technically correct. Uh, acetic acid's a good one. Water just makes, water would make the picture problematic, though it is technically a weak acid. Acetic acid is a good one. So let's look at acetic acid, which is CH3CO2H. We'd expect it to dissociate slightly to yield CH3CO2 minus, which is acetate and H plus. Now, if I'm drawing my picture of my solution of acetic acid, should I draw mainly ions or molecules? Should I draw mainly ions in solution or molecules? What should I draw for acetic acid? Molecules, exactly right. So just like our weak base example, we have mainly molecules. and we have a small amount of dissolved ions. There we go. So for a weak acid, just like our weak bases, we have mainly molecules in solution. Does that make sense to everyone? Anyone have any questions on our definitions of strong acids and bases, weak acids and bases? Okay, let's keep going then. So we have a list of common strong acids and strong bases just as a summary following the rules from above. Let's try, to, let's try working on this um, under guided problem solving. Let's try to characterize each of the species and let's draw out. So we're going to characterize each of these compounds as strong acids, strong bases, weak acids, weak bases, or neither. 
and we're going to indicate the major species in solution if it's soluble. So let's start with the first one, HClO4, perchloric acid. Is that a strong or a weak base? Strong or a weak base? Or is it a strong or a weak acid? What is it? Strong acid, strong base, weak acid, weak base. What is perchloric acid? Yep, it's a strong acid, exactly right. So then, because it's a strong acid, in solution, would we have mainly molecules or ions? Would you have ions, exactly right. So perchloric acid is gonna break down to yield H plus, because it is an acid, it breaks down to yield H plus and its conjugate base. So we have mainly ions in solution. What about lithium hydroxide? Would someone like to tell me, is lithium hydroxide an acid or a base? What is it? Strong base, exactly right. It's a soluble hydroxide salt. So soluble salts break up into ions in solution. We've, we've seen this before actually. So lithium hydroxide is going to break down into lithium plus and OH minus. Yep, perfect. Let's look now at sodium bromide. So sodium bromide, does it fall under any of our categories? Is it an acid or a base or is it neither? Does it have any of the functional groups that are hallmarks of acids or bases? What is sodium bromide? Is it a, what, but what is it? Is it an acid, a base, is it strong or weak? Does it fit any of the, does it match any of the strong acids and bases or any of the weak acids and bases that we've discussed? Or is it just a salt? Is it just a ionic salt? Let's think about this for a moment. Yep, that's exactly right. It's an ionic salt, yep. So sodium bromide, just as a soluble salt, breaks up to sodium plus and Br minus. But are we generating any hydroxide or protons in solution? Are we generating any an acidic or basic solution? No. So always look at the dissociation to help guide your, your responses. Now this is a pretty complicated looking molecule. This is would someone like to, to provide a name for this compound? We actually have named this compound before. And your nomenclature will help you out tremendously in assigning whether a compound is a strong or weak acid. Exactly right, this is oxalic acid. See, your nomenclature will help you out here. And my question to all of you is, is oxalic acid a strong or a weak acid? Is it strong or weak? weak, right? It's not on our list of strong acids, so we consider it quote-unquote weak. So then we would expect to see mainly what in solution? We expect to see mainly ions or molecules? Ions or molecules for a weak acid? Molecules, exactly right. Now, this is really setting the stage for when we get to net ionic equations for being able to write and depict in chemical reactions what is the major species in solution for each reactant and product. So we're building things up here. H2S, would someone like to provide me a name for H2S? And this will help us assign whether it's an acid or a base. Names are really useful tools. What's the name for H2S? Would someone like to provide the name for that? This will help us identify whether we have an acid, a base, or a salt. Hydrosulfuric acid, exactly right. So what is this? At the bare minimum, we know it's an acid, right? says so in the name. So is it a strong or weak acid? Is it on our list of strong acids? Is it on our list of strong acids? Yep, 
Hydrosulfuric? No, it's not on our list. Sulfuric is, but sulfuric and hydrosulfuric acid are very different. Hydrosulfuric acid is a weak acid. So would we expect to see mainly ions or molecules? Would we expect to see mainly ions or molecules? Yep, molecules, exactly right. Okay, perfect. So we're just about at the end of our scheduled lecture period. So what we're going to do 